coming up on UGTV. A special session of the unified government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas.
All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to ask the clerk to please announce the meeting. A special session has been held on Thursday, January 28, 2016, regarding the jail study, health campus update, and water pollution control rate structures. Roll call. King? Here. Markley? Here. Walters? Here. Philbrook? Here. Bynum? Here. Walker? Here. Townsend? Here. McKiernan? Here. Mugia? Here. Johnson? Here. Holland? Here. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go ahead and turn this directly over to Gordon Criswell as we look at the jail study that we have implemented. It's one of, we've made a commitment at the Unified Government to study all three of our public safety departments in a comprehensive manner. Um, they represent about 60% of our budget and public safety is our top priority in Wyandotte County. And we wanted to make sure that we're um, looking at every aspect of these departments in terms of how to most effectively provide public safety to our community. Um, not only to protect our community, but to protect our employees. And so this is a big part of that. Um, we appreciate all the work that's gone into this study. I would ask um, Gordon, as we do introductions, we also have some dignitaries in the audience as well who are not at the table. I want to make sure everyone gets introduced. Um, I know we have Judge York here. Um, I don't think she's a part of the presentation, but we're glad that you're here, Judge. Um, but I would just make, ask you to do all of your introductions. Okay. Mr. Criswell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, <coughs> Mr. Bach, and commissioners. Um, uh, first, we have uh, a couple of our dignitaries here. Uh, I've asked uh, Chief Judge Lampson to join you all, as well as Sheriff Ash and District Attorney Gorman. Uh, I did offer the invitation of Judge York to join you all around the big table, but she refused, and I couldn't convince her. So that was her choice, but thank you, Judge York, for being here. Um, I will let the consultants introduce themselves individually, but what we have tonight is the uh, final report of the comprehensive jail assessment and feasibility study. And just by way of history, this is part two of the feasibility and assessment that we did earlier this year. You may recall that uh, the same consultants came uh, a few months back and gave you all an overview of the um, other processes related to um, <clears throat> our criminal justice system. So the first part of their study, they looked at processes in community corrections, processes in uh, the district, uh, the district attorney's office and the courts, uh, processes around uh, those departments using uh, the most evidence-based uh, uh, material and, and information to make decisions about uh, folks who had gotten in trouble with the law. Uh, and so they gave you that overview um, a couple of months ago. Uh, tonight, uh, the focus will be on uh, the physical uh, recommendations around uh, the, uh, uh, the, the jail and the juvenile facility and, and what they are recommending uh, you all consider as it relates to uh, doing something differently with the, the uh, juvenile detention facility in our jail. And with that, uh, Bob, why don't you introduce your team and you guys can get started. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I'm uh, Dan Rowe with Trainer. We'll need you each to speak in directly into the microphone. Thank you. Sorry. I'm uh, Dan Rowe with Trainer Architects, and with me also is Bob Schwartz with uh, HOK Architects in St. Louis. Uh, on the end is Bob Goebel with Carter Goebel uh, Lee and Chris Monsma also with Carter Goebel. Bob and Chris uh, did a lot of the foundation work of a study over the past nine months uh, to understand the system. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to have uh, them talk for a little while just to kind of refresh that. Uh, we'll try not to spend too much time. Feel free to tell us to move on down the road. There's a lot of very technical information that got us to some of these recommendations. Um, secondly, I'd like, to, I'd like to compliment your system. Again, we four individuals only work within jail, courts, uh, juvenile environments. And so recognizing how your system is put together is unique, <clears throat> but it functions actually very well. Um, the way in which you actually have an active group each week uh, looking at how to remove someone from jail who shouldn't be in jail is a very unique aspect. So 
uh, every system has its little bumps uh, and things that work either well or not well, but the way in which your system is effectively reducing the population is very unique. It's actually uh, not as typical within uh, a lot of systems. So uh, <clears throat> if you see anything within this report that pokes at something that, that may have uh, a negative or a wave to improve, recognize overall your system is working exceptionally well. Uh, again, the complementary nature between your, your judiciary, uh, the sheriff's office, uh, the district attorney, all looking each week at who should be and who should not be in jail and making sure that those who are on a, a minor offense or who are safe to release to the public are being released is an excellent way to do it, and, it's, and it is a unique thing, so I complement that process. Um, <clears throat> lastly, before I turn it over, I think that some of the summary uh, of this is that you shouldn't have juveniles in an adult facility. And that is one of the first things you're going to see as a recommendation to remove juveniles from an adult facility and, and to put that service of juveniles, be it detention or all the other community-based services that juveniles need, and take that out of your adult jail. It's, 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 there's just a, uh, an incompatibility with that use. Beyond that, it's what are the options for removing those uh, the, the housing juveniles and how do you then adjust the backfilling of the adult jail with adult population to save you money and to get that system to work well. So with that, I'll, I'll open it up to, uh, uh, to Bob. Uh, our, our document uh, that's in front of you is 128 pages long. We will try not to bore you with all the detail. A lot of the information's here mostly so that if you have questions, we can refer to it. Uh, Bob uh, and Chris are gonna cover these first seven tasks that were ordered by the RFQ. Uh, and uh, while uh, we said to only go through this part in about five to 15 minutes. So direct us along forward. It, it is a rehash for some of you on information you've seen, but it's important foundation to lay the groundwork for that master plan. All I want to say is there's no six up there because task six was the interim report that we gave you back in October. So those are all substantive tasks that make up the work that Chris is and I will be talking about. Thank you. Again, um, I'm Chris Monsma with CGL Companies. I'm a statistician, and I do our needs assessments and uh, projection analysis. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to whittle this down as much as I can. I could talk about statistics all night. I'm sure you don't want to listen about statistics all night. <clears throat> we did work here about 10 years ago, which laid a nice foundation because I was able to use 10 years of data from 1996 to 2006 and then added on to that data with the help of staff here to get us up to the 2000. Um, 14. Um, we look at many different factors when we do jail uh, projections. The first is demographics. Here is your county population. And throughout my presentation, you'll notice um, I'll, I'll show adult on the top <coughs> and juvenile on the bottom, when, especially when I get further in with um, populations and admissions. And so the top line here, again, is your adult, is your total population. Bottom line is your juveniles. We looked at arrests. Um, arrests are reported to the KBI. Uh, peaked in 2010. Um, again, adult on the top, juvenile on the bottom. Um, we did get detailed monthly data, which helped us um, in our projections uh, tremendously, but those were from 2004 forward. And this is our admissions. Admissions had trended downward from 2004. And the adult average daily population, we call it ADP, um, has increased from 1996. Uh, and then on the bottom, you'll see the, um, this is again, I, I'm sorry, this is the adult on the bottom here, but this is the monthly. And th this is where we'll see some of the trends moving forward. So I separated the adult in one slide here for ADP and the juvenile in the next slide. So your juvenile ADPs have remained relatively constant. It's a smaller population. And so there is, um, it's the law of small numbers. You're not gonna see as much um, fluctuation. Well, the fluctuation will be more pronounced, I should say. Uh, I show the admissions and ADP together to illustrate that just because admissions go one direction or another does not necessarily impact one-to-one -one your, your population in your jail. It, um, admissions and your length of stay will impact your um, ADP. Um, again, your, your admissions have, have decreased over time, but your population has increased in line down. This slide is your length of stay on the top of the adults bombs of juveniles um, pretty consistent um, a, a slight increase in length of stay uh, lots of numbers here I'm not going to go over them but because of the uh, monthly data we were able to determine the peaking which um, jails cannot 
be planned for uh, a static number because there are fluctuations in populations. So we look at your historic population fluctuations to determine the projected uh, population bed space need. Again, top was uh, adult, bottom juvenile. That, that factor is a way to help avoid overcrowding on a temporary <coughs> basis. It accounts for the average of what the peaks were over several years. So it adds a few more beds to the system, but it does then prevent you from having to get in a difficult situation with some crowding. I've been told to move it along. Um, the ADP projections, um, the, the solid line is your historical data and then projected out in the dash data. Uh, I do um, a recommended line, which is in the middle here, but then we also show an upper bound and a lower bound. Uh, we extended our projections out to 2045 for Wyandotte County. Um, adult on the top, juvenile on the bottom. We take in a peaking value, and we also look at classification of inmates. That would be uh, inmates need to be separated because of gender or gang-related reasons, and to determine a bed space need. An adult bed space need is um, projected to be at 847. That's our recommended for adults in 2045. Juveniles decreasing to 33. And now I'll turn it over to Bob. Uh, the second part of what you ask is, ah, sorry, so, it's working. Okay. The second uh, part of what you ask us to do that I'll try to summarize quickly again because uh, many of you saw this in October was questions about cost. And so we start out by looking at what is the total count in, and the reason for 2014 is when we started this in 2015, 2014 is the first complete fiscal year of data that we could use. So. You can see the bottom line, 445 total adult uh, average daily population in the jail and Leavenworth housing where you do the so-called farm outs, which averaged about 117 inmates uh, for this past year. Uh, that, the two points here, the jail housing right now, as you see in this first bullet point, is restricted to about 330 inmates, even though the capacity physically could be more the difficulty is the staffing. You don't have the staffing to be able to safely and securely manage more than that number. So when it hits, you know, the high 320s, they start moving. Um, the other point there that's important at the bottom, the throughput or the movement through your intake transfer booking release area is, is something that could be increased substantially by removing the juvenile section that got taken over years ago when you decided to put juveniles in what was designed as an adult jail. So part of what we saw in our analysis was that you, if you not only, as Dan alluded to, taking the juveniles out where they need to be, and not just because it's something that somebody thinks is a good idea, but you also would stand to lose the opportunity for grants from the Department of Justice for the Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency Programs they used to just say sight and sound separation, but now they actually really are pushing for physically separate and separate facilities. The good thing, the good benefit of doing that, though, is also a benefit to the adult side for your jail because you can then recover the booking and intake space that was taken over for juveniles, put it back to an adult process area, and the same thing with the housing, gain a lot more housing, a uh, significant number of housing beds for juveniles. Here's the... Um, Operating cost, you see 16.8 million is what we found for 2014. Um, it, it includes all expense items and any income from fees is noted, but it doesn't include any grants that may be temporary, you know, <coughs> grants that could come and go. Uh, the farm out cost does not cover, this is an important point to understand, when you look at the cost of, of renting beds outside, all you're doing is renting a bed. It's like a secure hotel or motel. It does not cover that cost per day to operate a full jail operation that includes all the court movements, all the tr various transports that have to be made, the whole booking intake transfer release functions, the programs that you provide for inmates and so forth. So th it's important that people understand you can't take those two and make them equal the cost of doing that would really go up significant highly, much higher if there was a way to contract to even have a company that could do all those things. And we don't see that really happening in the United States. You always see a separation between pretrial detainees and those that are sentenced uh, 
uh, to a local, uh, doing local time. And you see right there in, in 2014, there was almost, you know, approaching 2 million being spent on farm outs held in the Leavenworth facility. Um, now, transport cost was one other question you asked, is you wanted to know what if you decided for whatever reason to walk away from the site that you have today and build a jail at a site. So we took a theoretical of said, okay, let's assume 10 miles away, so there'd be about a 20 mile round trip between your courthouse and, and this theoretical new jail. And essentially, we, we looked at, uh, this is just all the cost of your existing transport operations, which cover everything that the sheriff's office does, and all types of inmate transport. It was important for us to look at that because that's one model of example of what it would, the cost factors would be to create a court transport service running every day back and forth. And you can see the numbers there for the 2014, there were 6,993 inmates. Uh, transported for court purpose. The bottom line that we found in this was two to, I, I used two different methods of estimation. The very small table up on the top just took that existing cost data and said, okay, what if we operated at the same way that we're operating today for the various transport we do? And the answer came out to about just a little over half a million added cost, 511 million. The larger table said, okay, let's create a court transport service that is, is a, you know, not just assuming somebody, some other existing cost. So I actually, you know, assumed the number of minivans, secure minivans we'd have to have, the number of staff, the hours, all the time that would be incorporated in running that, and whoops, uh, came up to 580 million. So point Thousand. being, Thousand pretty confident that somewhere in the half million range a year of added cost. Pardon? 580,000. Thousand, sorry. <laughs> that helps a lot. Half, <laughs> half a million. Saving, a lot of money. <laughs> Saving money already. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other, another part of the analysis you ask us to look at operating costs on the, the jail operation itself and the staffing in particular. What did we find for the staffing that you have today and essentially what we saw up here and you see was a budgeted of 122 versus 134 that we ended up recommending. Um, we found that one thing that was not being adequately covered was the what we call the relief factor for staff that's needed to cover all of the off time. When you have a 24-7 operation, whether it's a jail or a hospital, you're going to have to pay for staff to cover all the time that people are taking, you know, vacation, holiday, sick leave, in-service training, um, you know, all, all those other things, uh, bereavement, whatever it may be, that has to be accounted for. And so we did that. We went through that analysis. Um, what we did find was that staff were currently making available just one year of data on that. We rec one of our recommendations is you really need to take an average of three years because one year a lot of people may not have, you know, as much sick leave used. And so average that out over time. We also found not a lot of training being covered in the, the one year of data that we have that should be. So we, we see a need to really use that relief factor and get the proper amount of staff you need because that will avoid the use of overtime. That's the purpose of the relief factor is instead of automatically going to an overtime level of pay is to go to keeping people on straight time. And the big importance of that in the jail is burnout. If you're running jail staff that have to worry about the security of other inmates and themselves, you're going to run the risk of some things happening that shouldn't when you overwork people. So you can see the recommendations we have here. There are five intake and five sergeants needed instead for a, uh, instead of a total of nine, so one more uh, position there. Uh, two central control deputies are needed on the day shift when the busiest activity is going instead of one. And one deputy is needed in the medical clinic on day shift and only, but could <coughs> cut back to a half on the night shift. Medical transport, hospital duty needs two deputies on day and one on night shift. And finally, a classification technician on all shifts plus one only on Monday through Friday. So the, you see the, the difference we came up with there. 
what does that mean cost-wise? Again, we're looking at your current cost situation, not yet the future uh, long-term, but it came up to about 542000 to cover the um, added salary and fringe for 12 staff, about 542000 um, And again, that's for your 2015 operation. Now, the applying that relief factor in, in a proper way that's done in all uh, secure operations is what results in coming up to that 52 with the recommended positions that we showed you need, needing to be added. When you add, in other words, 1.2 staff for every personnel that you have to have running to keep it going 24-7, that's the number you come to. Um, detention officers themselves are the big need. Then you ask us to look ahead to the longer term, and we took 2025, and we took your current cost, uh, salary, fringe benefits rates, et cetera. We did an escalation at a projected rate of 1.5% per year for 2015 and 2016, and then jumped it to 2% for 17 through 25. We were trying to follow a pattern that we saw in some of the data that we were given of, of your, what's going on here now. So. Up to 2025, it looked like about up to a $8.8 million annual salary and fringe operating cost. On the juvenile side, um, it, it would go, it actually is a declining situation. And you're not alone in that. Throughout the country, we've seen significant declines in juvenile population. There are pockets here and there where it's going up. But as far as the projections that Chris went through, it looks like if current trends keep going, that we'll, we will, over the long haul, see a lesser number instead of a larger number. Again, that assumes status quo in terms of law, policy, et cetera. If, if all of a sudden there's some sig significant changes in the law that we can't predict, or policy about what to do or not to do with juvenile detainees, then that could change, it could go back up. Um, and I would say when you look at the history in a sense, it's kind of like the stock market. It does go up and down, but over the long haul, if a, if a jurisdiction is growing, then there's going to be subgrowth in the uh, justice populations. Now, just kind of final summary on all this cost data. Uh, the, big, the big one here, the big ticket item that we saw was the cost of 12 new staff over 12 months. And what that would do, and, and, and that whole focus was, what would it take to not have to farm out the 117 inmates to over to the Leavenworth facility? You have spent about 1.9, and instead you'd spend about 700,000, uh, about 732,000 to be able to keep them all in the jail in this 2014-2015 scenario. Court transport, I already mentioned, approximately half a million. Juvenile staffing, 10 more staff. Finally, in the last thing we were asked to look at was your community corrections operation and free trial services. Uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to look uh, detailed, this is an org chart uh, with, with Phil Lockman on top here, who uh, was here uh, years, 10, almost 10 years ago when we did our study. Uh, it, it has grown some, and we see the growth is in areas that applied research shows are successful areas to use for managing uh, offenders who don't need to be in a jail, who can be better served in a community level. So the lower level offenders that sometimes get caught up in the jail can benefit from these kinds of services. There's four categories, adult services, juvenile, pretrial house arrest, and criminal justice programs that are provided. Um, and everything we saw in your department uh, there were, were good programs. And here's some comments about, you know, the sufficiency and value of them. Uh, all of those are evidence-based practices. They're sound, good programs. Uh, and, and applied research does show that if you take the same program and you're able to provide that in a community setting versus a secure confinement setting, it tends to be more effective. 
And, and there are some results right there. The 2014-15 results show some promising redu reduction, reduction in failures. 70% of all discharge intensive supervision uh, adult probation adult cases were completed successfully. 60% on the juvenile side and 61% of all discharge juvenile diversions were completed successfully. And then also the, the probation revocations, big one here from 2014 to the year, uh, you in the year 2014, you reduced the revocations rate down to 31% that in 2007 were almost half, 51%. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty successful big jump. Um, then finally here on, on the dollar side of the programs, right over here in the final, final column is sort of the story. And what you see is pretrial house arrest about $354 per case for the year. Um, the caseload of intensive supervision services about 2,200. Uh, for adult on the juvenile side, it's more expensive. You're providing a lot more attention and service, so it goes to 5,400. And then finally, juvenile diversion services, about 1,600, where they're not being in jail at all, but rather perhaps in, in parental release or some other form of community custody, averaging about 1,300. So when you look at those kinds of things compared to the jail cost, it, you know, it's just common sense that for those offenders that are eligible, that are nonviolent, non-sex offenders in the case of adults um, that, that can be safely supervised at a community level after good risk and needs assessments are completed, there's, there's some economic benefit there too. Uh, so this is just a summary of all the things we've, we've already covered. I'll terminate and, and let Dan move on to the next section. We're not gonna uh, talk a lot about the existing facility. Uh, please do read through the report. There are about eight different sections that we cover. The building itself has actually been uh, maintained very well. You just have to recognize it's almost 30 years old. And so therefore, without a substantial renovation over those 30 years, it is simply worn. Uh, it has been refreshed with some paint and some, that, and, uh, some light, which is good. Um, but, and, and structurally it's sound. The good news is in 1989, you built a 50 year plus building. So it's, it's definitely worth the reinvestment and the upgrade. So it's, it's a good building been well maintained it's just a little wore out from its age uh, some of the things that are wore out you can see the portion of the roof uh, that has been uh, uh, replaced and the portion that still has not been replaced so a 30 year old original roof is going to have some leaks and problems and they have leaks and problems um, the the building envelope has uh, uh, it's a precast structure and it's it's uh, having some uh, joint issues that just need to be made um, those joints are talking that's 30 years old. So again, it's those types of deferred capital improvements and maintenance is offices areas, again, showing some drips and, and, and roof problems and some, uh, some finish issues. Uh, the detention and support areas will need a little increase as the increase uh, in inmate population grows. But other than that, they're well placed and uh, the growth potential is there for them to be added on to. The detention housing is very sta standard, typical 1980s type of stuff. So it needs natural light. Uh, it's, it's not bad, but it doesn't really meet ADA and some other guidelines that classifications really needing uh, to get there. Uh, really, your problems are in your HVAC. It's got the original chillers. So if you do any renovation at all, those will probably be, need to be replaced. Uh, it's got uh, an emergency generator, again, 30 years old nearly. So uh, some of the plumbing is really uh, having problems. Uh, uh, but, but generally, the, the building's got good bones and is, uh, as I say, uh, worth the reinvestment. One of the things that fail regularly are the elevators, and it's really probably your biggest security issue. It really is a very serious item. There are four elevators. All of them fail regularly. Uh, when the elevator fails with an inmate on board, it puts staff in jeopardy. It is something of a security issue. You should get replaced immediately. Uh, with that, um, we're going to get into a little bit of the master planning and, and the phasing. Uh, this is, I think, what you hoped that we would emphasize today and uh, 25 minutes into it we uh, we finally get to it so I apologize for the uh, for, for for laying the groundwork so thoroughly but uh, you can recognize your facility uh, in in the picture this is the jail we're going to get more into that this is existing courthouse the building we're in right now uh, the family courts building here and, and a parking structure so 
Um, one of the things that we saw as priorities within this is to remove the juvenile detention from an adult jail. It is really a bad situation and needs to be your first order of business. Uh, not only to help you uh, uh, adjust for the adult numbers that you're farming out, but also to get a better situation uh, to be able to treat uh, any and all juveniles through a continuum of care uh, for their condition. Uh, secondly, then maximize the use of that existing facilities, uh, provide adequate space and functions for the inmate population, and, uh, and then to make sure that the associated offices work well within that uh, confine. So what you're going to see are actually five primary phases that we're recommending. Phase one is to construct a new juvenile service center. We would see that as something that would provide services to juveniles at all levels, including detention, but also the alternative programs that can reduce and continue to reduce your, your juvenile numbers. Secondly is then to take the area where the juveniles were located and to backfill that area and remodel that uh, for adult space, uh, take care of your staffing for the, for the jail, and to remedy the deferred maintenance issues. <clears throat> Phase three then, and, uh, and this would only be, that should take you through the next 10 years of projected number of growth within your adult and juvenile jail. Our advice is because once you get into it 10 years, you really should take a look and say, what are our numbers actually doing? Are they fulfilling the projections or are they altering? And to refresh that, that before, so before you start phase three, take a deep breath and take a check, because this is down the road a little ways. <clears throat> One of the options is to renovate an area, such as the top floor of the courthouse, to relocate the district attorney's office. And the reason we recommend that isn't as much to accommodate the district attorney, although they do have growing needs. It's to take the area in which they're located, which you'll see, uh, which is very valuable space because it can be easily made within the con uh, secure environment, and to take that space to house adult offenders. And then to take, again, that space that the district attorney has vacated and use it uh, for adult expansion. So basically being able to expand the jail capacity without actually adding on. Third, then, are some options for, for adding on. And I'm going to turn it over to, to Bob Schwartz to kind of go through uh, some of this. We actually had this in a 3D model turnaround. Um, computer systems wouldn't allow us to load that on there. But uh, I think that this should help give you an idea about how this goes into place. Um, things are not necessarily scaled. We expanded this juvenile footprint so that you can see how a courtyard might function for some outdoor space there. Thanks, Dan. So what I'm going to go through is the, the different schemes and different views. And for phase one, we have three options on what we do with the juveniles. And this one says you do a juvenile facility, the juvenile service center, on this parking lot to the north of the existing jail and the reason we want this site is it's next to the family court so it's it's easy to move the, the kids from from the uh, juvenile service center to the courts and back and here you can see a blow up of what this includes so it includes like a lobby it has education services administration a, a family resource center integration uh, the program space and this piece here is the housing which can the uh, kids can use the courtyard for some outdoor rec you know, this is a an urban area and we want to have kind of protected uh, interior uh, outdoor space for them it's also important to protect the identity of a juvenile in custody so so ensuring that there's an outdoor space without being able to see directly out is important okay. and you can see another view And pros and cons, uh, basically uh, doing that adjacent to your existing family court will be your lowest initial cost. Uh, it has a great connection to the courts. Uh, you keep the courts and everything basically unchanged. So in other words, you don't have to change the location or, or situation in your family courts. And it keeps all the detention facilities in the same proximity as a campus. Cons is that there will be some views out of sleeping rooms will be limited or obscured because of, of the environment. Uh, also, the outdoor exercise facilities may be limited by the size of that courtyard we're able to create. Uh, making sure that views from adjacent buildings don't look down into a juvenile area and maybe uh, some restrictions on possible future expansions. The cost of, of that is both uh, construction and project costs. So if you look in your book, you can find actual some detail of that. 
uh, for purposes of time, the total project cost for that option A within phase one is about $21.6 million. And option B is looking at a site, like a suburban site that has not been designated, but it shows that it could be more open, that uh, you can have a, a ball field that you, you could put within this uh, downtown site. Part of the options of that is, the, is, is it possible to have a suburban site that would give an advantage to locating juveniles outside of the urban core? And, and obviously the pros and cons of that have on the next slide uh, is that it does allow better views and, and uh, confidentially privacy you can actually create kind of a, a number of acres that might give some campus type of feel to that uh, better flexible layout and easy expansion the cons are obviously now you would be transporting those juveniles to court uh, as well as then the site acquisition and selection issues costs that you'll fight the not in my backyard issues wherever you place that as well as then you would be remote from other county facilities the cost of doing that option, as you can see, is very similar, but it's about $19.8 million uh, to construct that on an adjacent uh, uh, greenfield type site. And this option is similar to, the, to B, except we put the family courts with it instead of having to do the transport. So obviously one of the pros is now you have the courts adjacent uh, with, with the juvenile uh, detention so you don't have that transportation. Uh, you do still have all of the uh, benefits that the previous option had. Um, obviously the cons are this is the highest initial cost because you're building more building. You still have the site acquisition costs and you're still remote from other county facilities. The cost of doing that, which is moving all the family courts, uh, associated um, offices, uh, as well as the juvenile function would be about $27.8 million. And then in phase two, this is where we go, and now that we've got the juveniles out of the adult jail, we can have space to move inmates around and do some maintenance, some, some upgrades uh, you know, inside the facility and outside as well. But uh, it gives us ability to move people around. It also allows us then to pump up the amount of people we can put into this facility based on staffing, and we said that you know, the maximum we like to have with one officer in a unit, 64 beds, that's the ACA standard. So that's what we cap in those larger units to just get as many people into <coughs> this existing jail as we could. Uh, and then we can also take, uh, this is showing you what's called the, the third and fourth floor. They actually go together. One we, we would call the day room level and one the mezzanine. But see here this is a typical kind of large pod that we would make a 64 bed but on this floor you have a lot of these smaller ones that have been subdivided either for the, the juveniles here in the corner here or for uh, females and, and special management so when we regain these uh, juvenile units then we can use them for smaller populations for like mental health and it gives more flexibility to uh, on you know, what you might need for females or other groups that, that really fits well with the uh, classification requirements. And it also has a lot of program space in here in the center that we could use for, again, mental health treatment, uh, just uh, special management type programs to help uh, also reduce some recidivism in the training. And then also looking at uh, we can recapture the uh, transfer area here that's now used for the juvenile intake. It was normally what we have is an intake transfer release. And right now everything is happening for the adults on this side and for the juveniles in here. And they're sharing the vehicle <coughs> Sally Port where they're, you know, the vehicle's brought in and they do secure transfer into the facility. So when we regain this, we'll have a better flow so that we can get those uh, inmates being transferred into a different area and those being released as well into a third area so they don't cross. This is where a lot of mistakes can happen 
to see if people go in both ways, if we can make it one way through. You know, this is what we strive for in, in design of, of uh, detention facilities. Might, might just interject, you might keep in mind that transfer includes the daily court transport back and forth to and from the courts every day. So it is a big deal that you can, if you can separate that traffic from any other traffic. And then what we would be looking for as we uh, are getting ready to expand, you know, the capacities is to expand some of the support areas by building out uh, the first level and second level are actually set back from the floors above. So we're looking at building out underneath that existing roof and being able to add like food storage in the kitchen, uh, staff dining, you know, with greater staff, uh, more lockers for the staff on this level. And then that gives us some extra space on the others as well. And the cost of this is, is uh, about half of that is tied up into replacing elevators, taking care of the roof, chiller, and other needs, so it's infrastructure, uh, deferred maintenance issues. The other half is actually the remodelings that were just referred to. So uh, that project, or phase two, would cost about $7.2 But again, that project, combined with the juvenile project, would help you offset that number that Bob was talking about to save that $1.9 million that you're spending on housing out. So that with the staffing costs should be something of a, of a net positive. So. so that's really towards the 2025 need. And so phase, phase three won't need to come into play until and after your growth of inmates as projected would occur. So if it doesn't occur, this phase can be pushed off down the road. Correct. So here what we're doing again is we're trying to maximize how many inmates we can have within the building, within that enclosure. And right now the district attorney on level two is kind of sandwiched between the intake and the housing. So they've got secure areas of detention of the detention center above and below them. So it made the good, it was a good uh, choice for us to say, well, the you know, district attorney really could be in a different location, wouldn't have to worry about the leaks they get from the, <coughs> from the plumbing, and make that all detention you know, facility up and down. All we have to do is, is uh, work with a secure perimeter, but it's secure above and below. The cost of that would really depend upon how much space was needed and, and in fact, where the final destination for the district attorney would go, but it's about $6.4 million. Right, it could go in any number of locations. So here, this is where the district attorney is now, on the north side of, of level two, and it has a, uh, a court right here, which we would keep. And then we could actually create two uh, dormitories, single level dorms with some rec in these uh, areas out from uh, the building above. And then that gives us areas for the, the lower classifications or the trustees that were doing, you know, working in the kitchen or the laundry and could have a nicer uh, environment. We retain the court and this already has secure elevators opening out into this area. So we would use those elevators as well for transfer of food and, and the inmates up and down the facility. Again, the cost of, of uh, making that uh, district attorney's office into housing for uh, inmates, adult inmates down the road would be about 4.9 million in today's dollars. Okay, and then we looked at what do we do beyond, uh, beyond that horizon. You know, so that takes care of us for another 10 years or so that we need to uh, look for more uh, jail beds beyond that. So this one said, well, we have this courtyard between the buildings, between the courthouse and the detention center, and you know, we have an entry here on the north side, one on the south, and that's used a lot for, for servicing both the courthouse and the uh, detention center. I said, well, what if we put new beds there, fit it within that space, it could tie to that existing link between the two that already exists. And that's showing you a, a better view of it. So it has, it's attached to the link. 
it would have an elevator to serve it independently. And then it stacks two levels. You know, these are, each one of these housing units has two levels. So it stacked two of them so we could get 128 beds within this with some support underneath it. You know, we could have that be, could be an active lobby and be support for the courthouse as far as you know, the, the kind of loading areas that we'll be displacing. And then you can see how it would work with dormitories in the other, on the other level. Here's another view of what work looks at three-dimensionally. All the uh, glazing, we're using what's called borrowed light, where we don't have windows into the individual cells to directly to the outside. Instead, we introduce our natural light through the rec yard into the day space, and we have windows in the front of the cells. And that's uh, acceptable <coughs> means by the American Correctional Association of providing natural light. So it's a, uh, we don't have to worry about views from the jail cells back into the courthouse or to the sheriff's offices. Again, uh, there's some, there's some pro pros and cons about being able to do this. I, I would remind you that this is some 20 years down the road, so it's, it's a little bit of futuristic. So, um, you know, is that a good place to add on to the building was the first question that we were looking at. So there's some pros and cons to it, but the, and, and the reason that we're going to go with option 5B as well is just to say there's another way to begin to add on. I think you really ought to study where to add on to this building as the need comes up well down the road. So rather than go through those in detail. that Doing that would cost about $10 million. Again, that's in today's dollars. So. And then option B says, well, instead of going in this courtyard here, let's build a facility across to the south, across the street. And we, we've actually shown it as we could actually do those dormitory beds that we had in the first, in the previous phase here, as well as the cells, all on uh, these two levels, and tie it back to the third floor of the detention center. So now we have to build a bridge or a tunnel. And knowing you probably have a number of utilities and things here, we, we decide to use the bridge as being probably the most acceptable means to do it. And then we have, we show some additional surface parking because we are displacing parking with that juvenile facility. And I think it's important to point out as well, while we've shown this location, which is currently private property, so we don't want to alarm anyone that we're suggesting you buy this property and, and place it there, it could just as easily go where, you're, where the added surface parking is noted or in place of the parking structure uh, that's immediately to the west. So there's, there's, there are lots of ways to do it. What we're suggesting is, is this is the scale and magnitude of what an addition would be to house additional future inmates that are projected. Again, pros and cons of that. We're not crazy about the bridge and tunnel idea. I know the sheriff would probably get a little nervous about that, but I think that we can remedy that and, uh, and, and still make sure that it's a secure state staff circulation. Uh, it does keep everything in the campus, and it does uh, make sure that this building can be reused for, for a substantial period of time. And the cost of that's about $19 million. So again, that's in today's dollars, and that's a decision to make on down the road. With those phases, the, uh, the next thing, we have, we have two final tasks I'm wrapping up. The, uh, you ask us the, the validation of doing a lead certification process, um, and I, I, I tell you what, I'll come back to that if you have questions, but there's pro some pros and cons with using a lead certification process. It's a good rating system uh, to, to certify a green building and sustainable design. Uh, and then you ask us for some strategies on public education. Uh, you can read through the uh, two or three pages we've written on that. Uh, we have some advice. We've, we've had a lot of success in passing referendums, uh, especially in Kansas. Uh, the, our last two passed with a 82% and a 77% of the vote. There are reasons why that can happen and reasons why that can fail. Uh, happy to help you out on that. So pull the string on my back if that's a particular interest. Otherwise, you guys are busy. We've covered a lot of ground. Uh, 130 page document tried to in about 40 45 minutes so I apologize for going a little long but would like to address any questions you may have Commissioner Kane just and a, just, Walker just a comment it, it confirms that that uh, Sheriff Ash needs a little bit more money to do even a better job than what he's doing now 
but of all the slides that you showed, and this ties into to some issues that we have, there was only one security camera shown. And we don't have the amount of security cameras that we need for the family court, the courthouse, city hall, the jail. So I know that there's been a study on that, and I think we need to talk about that in the very near future. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Walker, can you speak directly into the microphone, sir? Well, I, I have accepted for a long time that we needed a separate juvenile facility. I'm afraid that my idea of what a juvenile facility should be is a good bit more spartan than what you're proposing. Uh, perhaps the location you've identified or a portion of it could be converted and connected to the existing old federal courthouse and separate the juveniles. My assumption is, given what I've experienced, that if you've got 35 or 40 juveniles in the pod over here, it's because they're pretty bad actors. Uh, we're not keeping people in there because they broke somebody's mailbox or, you know, they broke out a window. These, these, are, these are kids that need to be detained in some kind of secure facility. Everybody else is let go. And that would be true, in my opinion, of most of the adults. Nobody's in that adult facility that you feel comfortable. Well, actually, I think they probably have to release some that they don't feel comfortable releasing because they have others walking in the door that are more discomforting to not have a bed for. So I guess I had the idea of a, I don't want to, you know, minimize it, but a, 35, 40 room uh, residential facility that had appropriate bars and locks, not a whole new set of administrative uh, offices or courtrooms or um, these various other amenities. I frankly do not think the people of Wyandotte County have the stomach to swallow $30 million to build some of the things that you suggested. Now, you've thrown out a lot of numbers and a lot of options, and I'm not going to try to quote them, but it looked like to me it was anywhere from $21 million at, at one point to $34 million. And uh, I just don't think, given the tax situation and that, that we, we, we have the ability. I'm not saying what you didn't do is excellent. Uh, ideally, if you had the money, that would be the way you'd want to go, but I just don't pe think people are going to be very happy with us spending $21 million on a juvenile detention facility that you even project is going to have a reduced number of people in it over the coming years. So there's probably a lot we need to discuss about this study because I, I, I will have to tell you between when I got it, and I guess I actually, it was delivered Monday night, but we weren't there until Tuesday morning. <coughs> I didn't read all 128 pages of it. I'm sure I'm probably the only one up here, but uh, I, 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 there's a lot to study. I just want to say I think you did a great job. Your proposals are not, you know, out of the ballpark, but we're, I don't see that there would be much willingness spend that kind of money at this yeah. particular time for this facility. You, you point out a very valid point, Commissioner. I, I, I would like to talk a little bit about it and address it because it is a very, very, very important aspect of juvenile treatment. Uh, what you'll find is you can probably build a juvenile facility for $5 million, as you described, that has 30 or 40 cells and a day room and, uh, and at, you, you described exercise area Spartan area. and exercise area and all the minimum requirements. What you'll find is, is that your juvenile detention numbers will begin to grow. And what, what you'll find within a juvenile detention environment is that the old program of Scared Straight will work with a few kids, but what you're finding in current design for juvenile detention is to do a trauma-informed, which is to say, to figure out why the child came to the facility in the first place, and then remedy that, because it doesn't always root itself in into the kid's behavior, it roots itself into the surroundings. So it, it does need to involve counseling. 
Otherwise, the kid will come back into your system. The reason that the juvenile detention numbers are going down are because of the strong investment into keeping kids out of detention. It is your most expensive way in which to address any juvenile issue. So I would much rather you, no, I'm sorry, I started to say keep your existing facility and invest in programs. But the reality of it is you need to get juveniles out of your adult, and I think we're all in agreement. But the reality of the other thing is, is that your programs that you run for juveniles those that you run with families to counsel them, those that you run with families to counsel the families before their kids in trouble are the ones that will keep your detention numbers continuing to go lower. So my only concern with doing an understandably Spartan financial situation, and, and you can, and it, and it will solve your immediate problem, is that my concern is, is that your numbers will then begin to grow and you won't have a good foundation on which to, to build the way to treat juveniles. Because what you're really needing to build is a juvenile treatment center. And that, that means that you're interacting with juveniles who are delinquent from school and then acting with juveniles who've stolen mom and dad's car, then dealing with kids who are gang banging, and then dealing with the very violent. You're dealing with them all, and if you continue to go down a route that your current facility has, which is a very financially sound methodology of investing as little as possible into solving that problem, your problem will grow. So that's, I understand where you're at on, on the not spending $19 million. And frankly, if you said, let's set a budget somewhere down lower than that, that's more, more conservative and financially responsible. That's actually one of my bullets on the, on how to pass a referendum is make sure that it is financially responsible and that your community can't afford it. And I think some of what Bob's saving uh, on getting the adults back into the facility can actually help pay for that. And I think that's the, that's the key to getting it to work, so. Thank you. Commissioner McKiernan. You know, I agree with what you, whoa, holy cow, that's loud. So I agree with what you say there, but I think I've had the opportunity to talk to the sheriff about this. And when my eyes were finally open to the power of the money we're already spending, I just went, are you kidding me? We're currently budgeting $1.9 million a year for farm out costs. If we brought everybody back, you estimate about 700,000 in personnel costs, in, or they estimate about 700,000 in personnel costs internally for us to keep those people in-house. Well, that's a $1.2 million a year savings of money we're already spending. We're already budgeting that 1.9. If we bring them all back, we've got 1.2. That would be the bond payment annually on about $19 million worth of loans. So. There is the possibility of a juvenile facility and the cost of retrofitting and backfilling the current juvenile space in our existing adult jail and theoretically pay for most, if not all of it, out of money that we're already budgeting every year. And when I finally realized that, and the sheriff knows this, I just went, are you kidding me? <laughs> so I, I think we need to think about the money we're already spending and how we might be able to rearrange that to our benefit. All right, we have, we need to talk about a steps forward. This is our first look at it. So people need time to digest the report, spend some time. We want it, it is handy, I think, to have my first look at it with the consultants walking us through it. We did the same thing with the fire study. Uh, what we did with the fire study is we set up a group um, to move forward with a master plan, uh, short term, mid term, long term plan. We need to do the same with this group. Now, fortunately, we already have a jail population group that meets on a regular basis that was actually the group that put this, that worked with the consultants to put this report together. So uh, Chief Lampson and uh, Sheriff Ash and Mr. Gorman, um, we already have a team, um, a multifaceted team of all the groups that touch it and, and uh, Gordon Criswell obviously staffs that. We have two commissioners on it, Commissioners McKiernan and Walters, um, and so we need to make sure that we empower that group, I think, to take this study, digest it further, and I think in the next 60 days come back to us with a plan on how to move forward because there's going to be a lot of evaluation that's going to need to be done. We're going to need to continue to drill down on the financial pieces. Um, if there's a direction that we think we need to go, um, one of the things that's important, I think, is to look at integrated services. 
Um, all, and if you remember the slides, all of the money we spend on pretrial, parole, all of those community corrections pieces that we do, um, all the money we spend on the pretrial and house arrest is a dramatic cost savings from putting people in jail. Making sure we're fully funding those services um, and making, you know, we spend so much time focused on the jail population. Um, the, the, what we're doing with mental health right now of giving people a diversion to a 24-hour crisis center um, to get people out of jail is helping. That's a national trend also, but we're doing it locally. Um, all of the things that we can do to coordinate our efforts um, in the most holistic way on this campus um, is going to give us the greatest cost savings long term. And I think we already have the right people at the table. They were the right people to help the team put together this study. And I think they're going to be the right people moving forward to bring a recommendation to this commission on how to move forward. I would say we're a long way from announcing, I don't care if it's a $5 million, $10 million, $50 million project, we're a long way from announcing anything. Uh, we've got to get that team together, put the priorities together, and m chart a way forward for us. Um, so unless there's Unless there's some uh, disagreement on that, I think we empower the group that's already working on this to continue to work and bring us back. I think 60 days is a legitimate time frame to bring back a preliminary um, steps forward. And then we can assess that. Of course, the commission will be assessing every step forward um, in terms of what we do or what we don't do. Um, but I do think it's, I've long said we're long overdue in getting our juveniles out of prison and putting them in a rehab facility instead of a detention facility. There are a handful of juveniles who need to be locked up who are very dangerous. Um, and I would like to see some rehabilitation for the, for the rest, frankly, rehabilitation for that group too. But um, if you're very violent, you're going to be in jail for a while. So does anyone have a problem with empowering the group that's already been working on this to bring us forward in the next 60 days, a plan to move forward? Um, do, is there a better idea? I'm open to. Suggestions. I love them. I love what they're doing. It. All right, we love that you're doing it. All right, yes, Commissioner McKernan. If you may not is, beg off. So. Uh, <laughs> well, if that is, if that is the plan going forward, then what I would implore the rest of the commission to do is to give feedback to Commissioner Walters and myself, so that we know all of the concerns, all of the plans, so that we have information to take back to the rest of the group to help shape a recommendation that ultimately comes back here. That's right. All right. So that concludes the jail study. We are moving three major studies forward at the same time. I asked uh, Doug Bach why he chose to do that. <laughs> he reminded us it was our idea to move all three forward at the same time. Um, but we are underway with the fire study. We are now underway with the jail study. And the police study starts when? It's out for RFP, so we will be beginning this spring and summer the police study. So I appreciate everyone uh, doing this. It is 7 o'clock. We do have another presentation slated for our 5 o'clock. My inclination is to close this meeting and take that group, take us all downstairs and do that last presentation at the 7 o'clock rather than just running late. There are people waiting for us downstairs. I'll just move that item to the mayor's agenda so it'll be first on the agenda and we'll get that done as in order that we were planning to. So this, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for your work, and you. we are adjourned. Thank you very much. You did a great thank job. Uh, we'll be downstairs at 7.10. 7.10, that's 10 minutes.